Loving greetings and pranams. Welcome to all of you. This is a very joyous and auspicious day, the 100th anniversary of the day that Paramahansa Yogananda arrived in America, bringing for all of us India's ancient science of God realization, ancient science of yoga meditation that he was ordained to spread worldwide through Self-Realization Fellowship. I'm Brother Chidananda, speaking here from our Self-Realization Fellowship International Headquarters in Los Angeles. In a few moments, we're going to go live to Boston, where a group of our SRF monastics and members are gathered at the exact location where Paramahansaji stepped onto these shores on the waterfront there in Boston Harbor. And there in Boston, we're going to have a special commemorative ceremony. It'll last about 20 or 30 minutes. And of course, because of the social distancing restrictions that are currently in place, the gathering there physically is small. But I know that we're joined by thousands and thousands of Paramahansaji's followers and devotees and spiritual family who are participating online with all your hearts and all your souls from all over the world. It's a wonderful feeling. And then after the ceremony in Boston, then we'll switch back here to Los Angeles, where I'll join you again for a talk about the significance of this very joyous and historic anniversary. Before we go to our commemorative ceremony, though, just at the outset of our celebration, I'd like to just give a little summary, a little background, reminding us of some of the events that preceded, that led up to Paramahansaji stepping off the ship in Boston on that September morning 100 years ago. You remember, you know, it was just a few weeks before he left India that he had received the divine command to begin his worldwide mission. That took place at his school there in Ranchi, India, where he had that incredible, momentous vision that totally changed his life and, of course, would later change the lives of all of us. In one of his talks at the Mother Center, Paramahansaji described this event. Let me just share some of his words with you. Guruji said, one day in 1920, at my Yogoda Satsanga school in Ranchi, India, my mind suddenly became withdrawn. I knew that God was calling to me. I tried to seclude myself, but the schoolboys kept seeking me out for one reason or another. I thought I had succeeded when finally I hid in a little storeroom. And there I entered a deep state of ecstasy, samadhi, and a wondrous vision was passing before my inner gaze. And Gurji said, America, America, surely these people are Americans. That was my thought as a panorama of Western faces passed before my inward view. He wrote all about that in his autobiography of a yogi, as most of you will remember. And then Gurji went on to say, upon returning to ordinary consciousness, I noticed that one of the young boys was sitting quietly nearby. What were you whispering about in meditation? He asked me. And Guruji replied, the Lord was with me. He told me that I am going to America. In vision, I saw thousands of men, women, and children in that country following this path. And it was, you can get a sense of how momentous this vision was because astonishingly, Guruji tells us it was just a few hours later that he left Ranchi. He said, I entrained for Calcutta a few hours after my vision. And then in Calcutta, he said, the following day, I received an invitation to serve as the delegate from India to an international congress of religious liberals in America. It was to convene that year in Boston 
under the auspices of the American Unitarian Association. And Guruji said, my head in a whirl, I sought out Sri Yukteswar, his guru, in his ashram in Sarampore. Guruji, I have just been invited to address a religious congress in America. Shall I go? And Sri Yukteswar replied very simply, all doors are open for you. It is now or never. So, of course, as we all know, Paramahansaji began making hurried preparations for how he was going to travel to America. And it was only about a week before he departed that he had what he later described as one of the most sacred experiences of his entire life. And that was Mahavatar Babaji, that great deathless avatar, the one who had resurrected the lost science of Kriya Yoga. He came to the home in Calcutta where Paramahansaji was staying. And Babaji blessed him and said these words to him. Follow the behests of your guru and go to America. Fear not, you shall be protected. Long ago, I met your guru Yukteswar at a Kumbh Mela. I told him then that I would send you to him for training. And then Babaji made this prophecy, which has had so much meaning, so much significance in our personal lives, and as we see increasingly, in the unfoldment of spiritual consciousness around the world. Babaji told him, Kriya Yoga, the scientific technique of God-realization, will ultimately spread in all lands and aid in harmonizing the nations through man's personal transcendental perception of the Infinite Father. It was just about a week after this divine experience after this sacred visitation of Babaji that Paramahansaji set sail for America. He left Calcutta on August 3rd, 1920, and his ship was the city of Sparta. You can see uh, we have a scale model of it here. This is the city of Sparta that he made that, that voyage. This was the first passenger ship that was uh, traveling to America after the close of World War I. And he was at sea for about seven weeks. The ship, the city of Sparta, first it stopped at Colombo in Sri Lanka, then traveled up through the Suez Canal, crossed the Mediterranean Sea, made a stop at Gibraltar, and finally arrived in Boston on September 19, 1920. Let me just share, we'll show on screen, if you can put the pictures on screen now, let's show a little bit of what he would have seen as the ship there arrived at Boston. This is a modern uh, picture of the skyline now, and then here you have some historic pictures of that waterfront of the pier in Chelsea Harbor at Boston. Imagine what he was feeling. Imagine what he was bringing to all of us. And imagine as we step off the ship with him that we're greeting him there with joy, with gratitude, with a sense of the significance of that day 100 years ago. So now, dear ones, let's go live to Boston. Let's join the monastics and members who are gathered there so we can express together some of, the, some of the love, some of the gratitude, some of the joy for that one who came 100 years ago to bring to us God-realization and liberation. 14, 13, 12, 11, Welcome and greetings from our heart. 
on this beautiful sunny day we have gathered monks, nuns, and members of Self-Realization Fellowship on the dock in Chelsea Harbor here in Boston where a young Indian Swami Yogananda first set foot in America on September 19, 1920 on this dock 100 years ago. With great joy, the deepest love of our hearts, we pay tribute to that moment when symbolically Paramahansa Yogananda's life work began, the, th the spread of the sacred ancient Indian science of Kriya Yoga and the foundation of the one organization which he created to represent his life and to disseminate his teachings worldwide. It was a historic moment and also a sacred moment for all of mankind. A great spiritual awakening took place when Paramahansa Yogananda first stepped off the ship, the city of Sparta, and walked on this dock 100 years ago. As part of the welcome to all of you, those who are gathered here and worldwide who are watching online, I'd like to read Paramahansa's words. I came alone to America in which I had not a single friend, but there I found thousands ready to serve the timeless soul teachings. He came alone, but he foresaw there would be thousands. And that's what we're experiencing this morning as we welcome all of you worldwide. Thousands of people whose lives have been touched by the life and teachings of the great Guru, Paramahansa Yogananda. So we'd like to now honor the Guru We'll now sing a devotional chant, hymn to Brahma, first in Sanskrit and then in English.
to capture the spirit of that sacred moment when the great Guru first set foot here on the dock, his first step in America. I'd like to share these thoughts, his words, on what was going through his mind, through his consciousness, when he arrived. The voyage took nearly two months. Late in September, we docked at Chelsea Harbor near Boston before dawn. As I watched the steamer nearing the landing and saw America for the first time, my thoughts were very sad. Gazing at the twinkling lights in the harbor, I thought of India and how alone I was here, not a soul I knew. Then I remembered the faces I had seen in vision that day in Ranchi. I have seen and met and recognized many of them, including some of you who are here today. I think Guruji knows that we're all here today and all of you around the world, I'm sure he's conscious on this sacred occasion. He foresaw each and every one of us and joins us today in spirit. And then he said, but at the moment on the ship, I realized acutely the difficulty of my situation and felt extremely forlorn. But those sleeping memories of friends, once more to be, once more to be, came sweeping over me, banishing my fear and loneliness. And then he said, I saw in vision the faces of many here whom I had known before in previous lives and a great joy came over me. A great joy came over me. So when he first set foot here in America, here in Boston, on this dock, he brought his great joy. I'd now like to share with you, when Guruji went to India in 1935 and 36, when he returned, Rajasi Janakananda sent Master a telegram. He arrived in New York, but evidently the Master had told Rajasi about his arrival here, that he had arrived alone, there was no one to greet him. So Rajasi sent this telegram to the Master which I think is also fitting now that we're gathered here today. This time, your landing in America finds a host of devotees, and not just here in America, but worldwide, to all of you who are viewing today. Finds a host of devotees eagerly awaiting India's grace in your embodiment. With heart throbbing with deepest love, and devotion for you and the masters and blending with your heart in oneness with the love of Divine Mother with exploding joy and immeasurable gratitude we greet and welcome you and humbly offer our prayers for your divine blessings and love we offer our prayers to the Divine Guru Now I'd like to perform just a symbolic offering to the gurus with incense and flowers. The incense symbolically representing the sweet fragrance of our love and devotion and the flowers, the purity and beauty of the God communion that the guru has brought into our lives.
continue. One of the master's most advanced disciples, Sister Gyanamata, wrote something very beautiful that I think is most appropriate for this occasion. She wrote in a letter to one of the disciples, the master has come. The master has come from the other side of the world to seek and gather his disciples around him. You have welcomed him joyfully. Perhaps you have said, as I did, he came for me. He came for me. Hold that thought in your mind in your heart, he came for me, shutting out all others in order to make this great moment, this great moment, more intensely personal. To make this great moment more intensely personal. That the thought, I have met my Guru, he has come. Now I must be receptive to him. That that thought might burn with a living, deathless flame on the altar of your devotion. He came for me. We'll now ask those devotees who are present to come forward by one, one by one, to offer flowers to the Guru. And holding those thoughts, he came for me. The intense devotion, the great love that we feel in our hearts for the Divine Guru, that each of you around the world join us symbolically and make an offering to the beloved Master.
On behalf of all of you who've joined us on this beautiful sacred morning online, I'd like to offer flower petals on your behalf. If you'd like to close your eyes, visualize the Guru at the Katasta, the spiritual eye, fill your heart with the deepest devotion. And on your behalf, I offer these rose petals as a symbol of your great love and devotion for the Divine Guru. I think it's only fitting on this blessed occasion to end by reading words of Paramahansa Yogananda, a poem, the Guru's Prayer for all self-realizationists. Father, Thou alone art the King, sitting on the throne of my heart. May I always remember, not myself, but Thee. All those who come to me, bless them. Thou art my life, my love, my everything. To Thee I pledge unconditional loyalty. May Thy love shine forever on the sanctuary of my devotion and may I be able to awaken thy love in all hearts. As thou hast given me the will, strength, and power to bring other souls back to thy grace, those who have wandered, brothers and sisters, strain on the pathway of incarnations, make me the transparent medium through which thy light enters their hearts, dispelling darkness forevermore. Father, mother, friend, beloved God, I thank thee from the innermost soul that thou hast graced my life with thine omnipresence. Help me to spread thy message. I want to extol not myself, but thee. Be thou the speaker through my voice. May my will always express thy will. Be thou the only desire behind all my desires. All the devotees who come to me, I offer at thy feet. Change them, Father. Do for them as thou wilt. Not my wish, but thine. For thou art the Lord of my heart. Thou hast ever blessed me by granting all my prayers. In this closing chapter of my life, be thou the one life guiding me, giving me the sole longing to place thee in the hearts of all devotees thou hast sent to me. May thy greatest blessing be that they remain constantly with thee in wakeful hours and in time of sleep and dreams with thee ever through eternity and feeling thy presence even in this dream of incarnation. Be thou alone the king reigning in their hearts all my love, all my devotion, all my loyalty, I pour at thy feet. For I see the dreams of this life have all 
passed away, and thou alone art ever my beloved. May I rouse that love in the hearts of others that they see thy presence behind the delusion of life. What word shall I speak from the sincerity of my heart? The greatest gift I have to bestow on those I love, thy devotees, is awakening thy love in their hearts for thy love's sake. Father, mother, friend, beloved God, no more with words will I pray, but with my heart, with the fervor of my intuition. For I know thou art listening to my voice of prayer and to every call of my soul. Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti Om, Shanti Om, Shanti Om. Jai Guru, Jai Guru. Deepest thanks to Brother Vishwananda, Sister Brahmani, the other monastics, and our dear, dear devotees from the Boston Center. I can't tell you what a thrill it was to be sitting here, as I know it is for uh, countless, countless of Guruji's devoted disciples around the world. What a thrill it was to, uh, to watch you there on the waterfront on behalf of all of us, welcoming our blessed Master, the one sent by God to lead us to liberation. Those of you who are watching, Brother Vishwananda and some of the monks here from Los Angeles, uh, traveled to Boston earlier this week. And then uh, uh, some of our nuns from our ashram and retreat in Greenfield in Front Royal, Virginia, also drove up to participate. So Brother Vishwananda and Sister Brahmani, who were conducting the service, and all the monks and nuns, and all of us now in all of Guruji's ashrams, here in America, in Germany, in India, all are joining together with, as I said, with thousands and thousands of uh, our dear spiritual family gathering together from around the world. What a thrill, what a joy. You know um, that um, simple devotional ceremony that was performed there of 
showering the guru with rose petals and paying respects with the devotional pranam. This was often done by the disciples during Paramahansaji's lifetime. And as you all know, uh, this is preserved in all of our commemoration ceremonies for the birthdays and masamadis of uh, our great gurus. And uh, watching that and thinking of it and participating in it, as I know all of you were doing, I recall some words of our beloved late president, Sri Dayamata. And one time during one of these ceremonies, she described what it was like when the devotees would conduct this uh, devotional observance during Guruji's lifetime. And here's what our beloved Ma said. She said, I remember watching Master as disciples went up to offer their respects and receive his blessing. Now, as I read these words, feel that this is your experience today. I remember watching Master as disciples went up to offer their respects and receive his blessing. I was spellbound, as I always was, by what happened within me when I would quietly gaze at Master. There was such tremendous love pouring from him. His face was lit with that humble, childlike smile so characteristic of Master, so shy, inexpressibly sweet, which we saw whenever someone paid him honor. How I revered that utter humility I observed in him. He often said to us, I receive your gifts of love, but I take them not for myself. What you offer to me, I in turn lay at the feet of my Divine Mother, who is my life, my love, my all. And Dayamataji went on and said, though he didn't want the disciples' love and devotion to be given to him personally, still it flowed to him from our hearts automatically because of what we receive from him. So many times I used to look at him and think, Master, I am eternally grateful to you because you have inspired in me an all-consuming love for God. I think she speaks on behalf of many, many of us. And, and we know because of those beautiful words that, that um, sacred prayer that Brother Vishwananda so beautifully shared to us in our Guru's own words, that was his only wish. That was his only purpose in traveling halfway around the world and bringing these teachings and founding this organization. And as Gyanamata said, he came for each of us. He came for me. You know, seeing those places uh, there on the waterfront and visualizing um, the site in Boston where he arrived in the United States, it, it makes us imagine, doesn't it? It makes us imagine what did that arrival signify? What did it mean? And to those who were present in Boston on that day, 100 years ago, who was this man? Who, who was Paramahansa Yogananda? There's a um, picturesque, <laughs> I, I should say, a uh, uh, colorful description in the newspaper that was printed uh, reporting on the, his arrival. And many of you have seen that because it's reproduced in our SRF wall calendar for this month, for September of 1920. And the newspaper reporter had this to say, talking about the different passengers who were, embar uh, who were uh, landing from the ship there. And he said, one of them, a picturesque figure in the group, was Swami Yogananda Giri, a Hindu from Ranchi, India. He wore a brilliant costume, and he almost knocked out the newspapermen when he bid them good morning in perfectly good English. Well, uh, their expectations clearly were not very high for that, this 
turban swami from the mysterious east. But as we know, as the years went by, Americans gradually grew not only in appreciation, but in reverence for what he was and what he brought. So as we celebrate this 100th anniversary, let's spend just a few moments appreciating what he was. You know, outwardly speaking, our Guru Paramahansaji excelled in many roles, many roles. He was a God-filled seer and saint, philosopher and poet, as one distinguished professor who met him later put it. He was an educator, not only because of the boys' school that he had founded in Ranchi, but he was a real educator, one who taught people how to live. He was a psychologist. Again, not the academic or professorial type, but an expert in the practical psychology of understanding and mastering the mind-body instruments of the soul. And that, of course, is the foundation of how to live, the foundation of the art of balanced spiritual living. He was, as we all know, an author of many wonderful books. He was an orator, one of the best of his time. He was a musician. He was a cook. He was a shining apostle of world peace and brotherhood. And he was a conqueror, conqueror of himself and of the obstructions to his mission of spreading divine truth. We'll talk about that in a little bit later. But then, perhaps most sweetly touching of all, for each of us, he was a friend. He was a friend. Again, let me share these beautiful words of our revered Diamataji about that friendship. And as I said, put yourself in the place of she as, as these words are spoken. Diama said, of all the human beings I have known in this world, there is one and only one to whom I knew I could always go and bear my soul without the slightest reservation. That was and is my guru. He radiated so much love, which filled our hearts with the deep, reassuring sense of security. We knew he understood every weakness we, we had, every trial we passed through, all the unspoken desires and frustrations of our heart, even the ignoble ones. And yet, he remained always the same toward us. His love, his friendship were and are unconditional. Ma goes on to say, certainly we are all going to fall once in a while. Certainly there are times when we're displeased with ourselves and we feel that we're falling short of our goal. But Master was not concerned with how many times we erred. He was not the slightest bit, the least bit interested in judging us for the mistakes we made. He was interested in only one thing. Even though you fall, are you constantly striving to pick yourself up and go on? Ask his help and guidance, Ma says. Ask his help and guidance in removing the bonds that imprison your soul. In the background of your mind, let there always be a silent, steady, devotional conversation going on between you and the one who intercedes with God on your behalf, your guru. So of all of these roles, all of these accomplishments, again, perhaps the sweetest and most personal was that wonderful divine friend that he was and is to all of us. And lastly, there's one more role. And this, this is obvious, no doubt, but I want to speak a little bit about it because of this special anniversary. And that is, he was a messenger. And as I said, and that's obvious in one way because he brought the great message of Kriya Yoga. 
He was the messenger, the representative of a tremendously powerful, tremendously exalted lineage of gurus. Babaji, Mahiri Mahashai, and Swami Sri Yukteswar in communion with Jesus Christ and Bhagavan Krishna. So when we, as we've done there in this wonderful live stream, when we think of him stepping off that ship there in Boston Harbor, we should also visualize that accompanying him like an unseen but very real, very tangible current of divine power and blessing was the presence of those great gurus whose messenger he was. He said one time, he said, remember, the great masters are behind this work. The great masters who sent me are behind this work. And if you keep in tune, you will be conscious of that link with the gurus. You will feel their power and their guidance in your life. But there's another aspect to this too, this aspect of his role as a divine messenger. And that is this. He not only conveyed an epoch-making message, but in the most impressive sense, he was the message. In other words, his whole life, his whole being was a divine scripture. One that communicated, here is what you can become. Listen to these words of an early student of his who met him in the 1920s. This man wrote, let me describe him to you. He had a most noble profile with a well-shaped nose and a full round throat. His eyes, however, were the most amazing part of him. He had large brown eyes which were friendly and alive with a life beyond any eyes I have ever seen. Truth and sincerity shone from them. You felt that he was a man apart. He was one of the healthiest men, perhaps the most healthy, whom I had ever met, but not a type which we see advertised by our gymnasiums so blatantly. No, rather he looked magnificent in his abounding health, his erect posture, and his utter ease. His dark skin was not swarthy, but rather radiant with health and had a vibrant glow. His face, as a general rule, was smiling, and he exuded good nature and sympathetic understanding, even though there was a most definite sense of power about him. And he concluded and said, it is hard to describe the kingliness of the man without giving the wrong impression. He was the message. Personally, I, I found this out in a uh, very direct way when I first read Autobiography of a Yogi. I was a young man still in college studying at university when I first read that book. And as many of you experienced, after I started reading it, I was enthralled. Its teachings, its message, the vistas of spiritual adventure, of spiritual potential that the book delivered, that completely captivated me. But the most impact came when I got to the very last chapter, when I turned the page and saw that photo of Paramahansaji called The Last Smile. When I saw that photo, I instantly felt anyone who can look like that is clearly telling the truth about God and how to know him. And I knew that this was my spiritual path. He was the message. He is the message. So up till now, we've been talking about who Paramahansaji was and what he brought when arriving in the U.S. 100 years ago. But thus far, we have been dwelling mostly on the outer aspects 
about his roles, about his accomplishments, his physical characteristics. But naturally, of course, his real being was what he was inside. Outwardly, he was a Hindu, an adopted American, a citizen of the world. He had all the superlative accomplishments and qualities that we've touched on so far. But in one of his poems, he revealed what his own inner experience was. He wrote this description. He said, I have no country, no homeland dear, nor am I Hindu or Christian seer, nor Occidental, nor Oriental, race bound behind the bars of inheritance. My spirit revels in freedom. It's only religion, freedom. Unknown to others, but known to myself, I wake and walk and dream, eat and drink and glide in joy. I myself am the joy I sought, the joy that all do seek. My spirit revels in freedom. It's only religion, freedom. You know, this is so interesting because this takes us back to the story of our Gooder's arrival in Boston, where he had come to speak at that Congress of Religious Liberals in 1920. Now, that Congress of Religious Liberals, which was um, drew religious leaders from different parts of the world, different parts of the United States, this was timed to celebrate a special anniversary. It was the 300th anniversary of the landing of the Pilgrim founders in America, those who came from Europe, from England, seeking freedom. And the theme of that conference, of that Congress, was what is the meaning of freedom? What is the, the real significance of freedom? Because they knew and they were celebrated. The, the, that landing of the Pilgrims in 1620 eventually evolved into the new United States of America built on that foundational principle, freedom. Foundational principle of freedom. And they wrote, those founding fathers wrote in the Declaration of Independence, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, and that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Stirring words, immortal words. But you know, most people may not realize it, but this is a very, very yogic concept. In fact, I think we can say, as you'll see as we get into this, yoga even goes a step further. Yoga goes even deeper than the politicians and the statesmen and those revolutionary leaders. Yoga says that life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness are not just inalienable rights, but inalienable forces or processes embedded in the very fabric of human nature. Think of it. Think of what you know, what you have studied and learned in the, in the lessons in your practice of meditation about that science of Raja Yoga that Paramahansaji brought. And think of that in terms of this concept of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Yoga tells us life energy or prana, liberty or free will, and the pursuit of happiness, or we might say the soul's desire for perfect bliss. These are forces that act through the soul's ten instruments, the five senses, the five instruments of bodily action, they act through those instruments with or without our permission, whether or not we choose. That's why I say this. These are not just inalienable rights, but inalienable forces or processes. I want to go a little deeper into this because we're talking about this 
um, Advent or this presentation that our guru came to give on the science of religion. And in his teachings, Paramahansa explains, each one of us, we come into the body at the time of conception. We come in as this divine soul cloaked in our astral and causal bodies of life energy and consciousness. And the soul, the soul pours that life and pours that consciousness into the body-mind instruments. This is the human condition. We have no choice in the matter. Life flows down and outward into the senses, into the nervous system, creating and enlivening the body and causing, this is the most important, causing the soul to identify with that body. Whether or not we choose, this is the human condition. But what we do have control over is how we live in that body. Whether or not we remain identified with the body and its mirage of sensory desires and habits that bind and enslave us. That's the real slavery, to be bound, for the soul to be bound to that false concept of what we truly are. Kriya Yoga that our Guru brought 100 years ago to the West and, that, and thus to the world. Kriya Yoga, the SRF YSS teachings, that gives us the science of controlling that soul power of identification. The soul's power of identification. That's the process by which we, as the soul, take on the outer role, the qualities, the characteristics with which we identify for good or evil the qualities and the roles that we identify with for good or for evil. So again, it's all about how we manage those forces of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, the life energy, our free will endowment, and where do we pursue or where do we search for the fulfillment of that soul's desire for infinite bliss. That is the science of religion. And that is the essence of what he gave at that Congress of Religions, that Congress about the real meaning of freedom. We've all heard, we all know that his presentation at that Congress was titled The Science of Religion. It was also published in a small book, The Science of Religion. We have just um, released this SRF Centennial Edition. Small little book, but very powerful, very potent. And I want to take out of this discussion, this discourse, there really, we can boil it down to just three essential points in terms of what we're talking about today, in terms of the significance of what our Guru brought and gave at that Congress. So here are the three points. First of all, as Guruji says in the book, the sense of identification with the transitory body and restless mind is the source or root cause of our spiritual self's misery. The sense of identification with the transitory body and the restless mind, the root source of all of our suffering, of all of our unhappiness and difficulties in human life. First point. Second point is that religion, rightly understood and rightly conceived, religion consists of the permanent avoidance of such pain and the attainment of pure bliss or God. That was his universal definition of religion. Permanent avoidance of pain, and the attainment of bliss or God. And then he goes on to say, he goes on in the book and in his presentation to discuss what he called the easiest, most rational, and most fundamental methods, practical for all, that will free the ever blissful soul from its baneful connection and identification with the transitory body and mind, thus causing it to permanently avoid pain and gain, attain bliss, which constitutes religion. 
the most practical, the most rational, the easiest and most fundamental methods. Now this is perhaps a little philosophical, a little abstruse, but the point is, I want us to see, see how Guruji took that whole concept of freedom. And he showed that it is entirely dependent upon mastery of the science of religion. As he said, to free the ever blissful spiritual self from its baneful connection and identification with the transitory body and mind. In other words, he was saying, he was pointing out to Americans and to all citizens of every country in the world, unless and until our social ideals of freedom and equality are supported and informed by spiritual ideals of freedom, as he said, freedom from the degenerating impulses of our lower self, until then, the social ideal, whether in America or any other country, will remain only partially realized. How blessed we are, how fortunate we are that in the SRF YSS lessons, the teachings of Paramahansa Yogananda, he gave us, one, the right attitudes, and the right affirmations, and most of all, the right scientific techniques to gain control of that process of identification. That is the science of yoga. That is the science of religion. To realize that our true identity is oneness with spirit, oneness with God, and to realize that all other temporary identifications bring limitations, bring attachments, karma, the kleshas, the five troubles spoken of by Patanjali in his Yoga Sutras. And of course, that is the science of Kriya Yoga that his Guru sent. Science of religion. What more appropriate and what more comprehensive and, and profound a presentation could have been given on this anniversary of the meaning the 300th anniversary of the landing or the founding of America and the real meaning of freedom. Now I'd like to, I'd like to take a few minutes to talk about it, one more aspect of that first lecture on the science of religion. And um, here I want to point out that our situation today is actually quite similar to what he was experiencing when he stepped off that ship. You can see, you can understand from his reminiscences, Brother Vishwananda read some of those words describing what he was feeling up upon his arrival. He was in very unfamiliar territory. And so it's really timely for us and really interesting to note, he was experiencing many of the same things that many of us are feeling right now today. Insecurity about what to do in a situation where so many of the comfortable guideposts seem gone or no longer in place. Feeling of anxiety, feeling of uncertainty, with so many of our familiar routines, so many of our support systems taken away. Just as he experienced, coming into a totally new world, a totally new culture, and he described some of his early experiences, even not even knowing, well, what do I do about getting food? What do I do about getting water? Uh, gradually, he adapted himself and gradually he found, he navigated his way through that initial uncertainty, that initial insecurity. How did he do it? Because he had something to rely on, not only to get through those difficulties, but ultimately, to achieve what we, we know and what we see looking back a hundred years later, what we see that he achieved, a glorious and world-changing victory. And what he relied on, that is also available to us. What is it? It is simply this, that despite the changing and um, troublesome outer conditions, whatever they are, there are eternal principles 
They're spiritual laws that never change. Everything around us can be changing, but the eternal truth, the eternal principles and spiritual laws never change. And we can always realign ourselves with them to reorient our sense of direction, to ground ourselves, to give ourselves a firm footing with which to confront whatever life throws at us. What are those eternal principles? What are those eternal laws? You know, again, that is the science of religion. In the book and his lecture on the science of religion, Guruji talks about this. He says, he says, he says, he devotes quite a bit of time to clarifying, well, what exactly does that word mean, religion? And he says that it comes from this Latin word, religare, to bind, to bind. And he says, religion, rightly understood, religion binds us by the rules, laws, and, injun and injunctions in order that we may not degenerate in order that we may not be in misery, bodily, mentally, or spiritually. In other words, taking it right back to that attainment of freedom that we talked about, that freedom from identification with the lower self, the lower nature, and resurrecting and manifesting and expressing in our own lives and in our relations with those around us, the true, pure, exalted, transcendental nature of our real self, the soul. So religion, he said, is what, that which binds us to these eternal laws so that we may not degenerate, so we may not be in misery. You know, another way of saying this is simply this, that religion, religion consists of the methods, the science of keeping our divine connection intact, keeping our contact keeping that link with that unseen grace and power and security of God, bound, keeping ourselves bound to the eternal source of strength, of wisdom, security, no matter how chaotic or how insecure our, our, our outer circumstances may be. Many of you remember and know that shortly after Gurji's arrival in America, he met two of his lifelong disciples, and this were Dr. M. W. Lewis and his wife, Mrs. Mildred Lewis. And they, uh, Dr. Lewis was the first one to, to uh, take Kriya Yoga initiation from Gurji a few months after his arrival. And I wanted to share this one little story that uh, Mrs. Lewis, Mildred Lewis, told because it so much illustrates, it so much points out to us um, his attitude and that spirit of victory by which he, he was able to deal with that insecurity and put himself on the road to that ultimate and glorious victory, same as all the rest of us want to do. So Mrs. Lewis said, when Master was staying with us at our house in West Somerville, that's a um, neighboring city of Boston. She said he loved to play on the large pipe organ that we had in the house. She said, I think his favorite chant was this one by Swami Ram Tirtha, a saint of 19th century India. Mm, you, all, you all know this chant, don't you? The words are, none can atone me, say who would injure me? And it expresses this attitude of a divine conqueror. The world turns aside to make room for me. I come, O oh blazing light, the shadows must flee. Beware, O oh ye mountains, stand not in my way. Your ribs will be shattered and tattered today. I hitch to my chariot the fates and the gods. In the voice of thunder proclaim it abroad. Howl, O ye winds, blow, bugles, blow free. Liberty, 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 ohm. And Mrs. Lewis said, he would open up all the stops on the organ, and I would often say, we're going to have to move if you play so loud. And with the windows closed even, you could hear the organ a block away. <laughs> 
Well, that's the spirit of how he accomplished that amazing work that he did. That's the spirit. He one time said, many people are afraid of life's problems. I have never feared them, for I have, I have always prayed, Lord, may thy power increase in me. Keep me in the positive consciousness that with thy help, I can always overcome my difficulties. So that's for each of us. During these times when things are uncertain, when we're confronted with many different unexpected and, and um, challenging uh, threats to our peace of mind, to our well-being, to even to our physical security, anytime we feel overwhelmed, use that as our prayer. Look in the spiritual eye, feel that divine connection, and then repeat as Guruji said, Lord, may thy power increase in me. Keep me in the positive consciousness that with thy help, I can always overcome my difficulties. Well, certainly we have plenty of problems threatening to overwhelm us right now, isn't it? And let me say now, too, I, I often bring this up, but it, it can never be repeated too much because it comes from my heart and from the hearts of all of us monks and nuns. Every day, we are praying for each of you. Every day, we are in meditation, visualizing that great power, that great help, that healing vibration, that healing light of faith and courage and divine presence flowing into the homes and into the lives of each one of you. We're not alone in this. We're not alone. And that, uh, that brings us to this other point that I wanted to make about the crises that our world is facing right now. You know, it's not just that we are confronted with outer catastrophes or outer um, difficulties such as a pandemic or the wildfires or the hurricanes and floods or the distress of the economy and so on. The list goes on and on. It will always go on and on. But even perhaps more concerning than those outer conditions, even worse than that, is that over the last few years, decades, but particularly in, the, in this current uh, cycle of our, uh, of our history, of our relationship, that we seem to be losing this sense of mutual support. We seem to be, it seems to be eroding away the, the, the bonds that unite us, that we share as a human family, as a community. And you know, it's, I don't think any of us would disagree that all the world's problems seem worse today because we have lost, to some degree, the common basis for confronting them as a unified team, as a unified family. We feel alienated, too many of us, so many of us, certainly in the United States in this particular time. There's this divisiveness, this sense of isolated camps and factions that keep us separated from each other because the fabric or the threads that wove us together, the shared moral and spiritual values that are the basis of our civilization, these are being frayed and torn. And that's why we feel distant. That's why we feel alienated from each other. But we can take advantage now and always of a great spiritual truth. And this applies to all relationships, whether it's marriage relationship, relationship of family members, in the workplace, in communities, in nations, in the world at large. And that is this. Here's the principle that the closer we get to God and truth, the closer we get to each other. The closer we get to God, the closer we get to each other. You know, I like to illustrate it by thinking of, the, of a triangle or a pyramid. You know, uh, when you're down here at the bottom, say the, uh, the two sides of the triangle represent uh, two people or two, two communities or two groups. When you're down at the bottom, 
you're quite a ways apart, aren't you? But as you move toward the apex of the triangle or the pyramid, then people move closer together. The closer you move toward the apex, the closer you move toward each other. God is the apex of human life. And moving toward God, moving toward God is the most powerful way of moving closer to each other, to rediscover that togetherness, that spirit of unity. Yes, we have differences. Yes, there will always be differences of opinion. But underlying that, a respect, a sense of we're all in this together, that togetherness that we have lost by ignoring moral and spiritual truths, by thinking that we can live happily without religion. Now, we know sectarian religion is not what we're talking about. Sectarian religion too often is divisive, too often is a contributor to these conflicts and this um, sense of alienation of one group against another. We all know that. But the need of our time is not for that sectarian religion. The need is for a universally appealing religion. And maybe, maybe we can say one that doesn't even use or doesn't even need the name religion because it addresses the universal human condition, not just meant for this sect or that denomination. And that, of course, is what Paramahansa Yogananda introduced to the world after his arrival in America 100 years ago this day. Let me quote again from his book, The Science of Religion, the talk that he gave there. He tells us so, so concisely and so beautifully, religion necessarily consists in the permanent removal of pain and the realization of bliss or God. And the actions we must adopt for the permanent, for the permanent avoidance of pain and realization of bliss or God, those are called religious. If we understand religion in this way, then its universality becomes obvious. Its universality becomes obvious. He says, it is only the limited human point of view that overlooks this underlying universal element in the so-called different religions of the world. And this overlooking has been the cause of many evils. So I like to think that as we dive deeper into the message that he gave in that talk, in that book, The Science of Religion, maybe we can think of a, a more detailed description, more descriptive of what he actually gave would be this. Why mastery of the science of religion is the secret of a joyous and successful life and a harmonious world civilization. You know, I, I'm not talking now, this is not just about the, the one little book, The Science of Religion. The entire teaching that he brought is the science of religion. We have, as he said, the three pillars of the SRF and YSS spiritual path. And that is the original yoga of the Bhagavad Gita and the how to live principles that he expounded in his commentary on the Gita, God Talks with Arjuna. That's one pillar. Second pillar, the yoga of the original teachings of Jesus Christ and the how to live principles that Jesus taught. Again, as explained by him in his commentary on the Gospels, the second coming of Christ. And third pillar of the, of the path that we follow, the SRF YSS lessons with their techniques and the how to live anthologies, I would say, of our Guru's talks, Man's Eternal Quest, The Divine Romance, and so on. These are the science of religion. These, I know many of you feel the same way. These are the salvation for our own personal life confronted with the conditions, the unique conditions, the trying and difficult and challenging conditions of modern life, and also for a more peaceful, more harmonious world civilization. You know, the Bhagavad Gita tells us that whenever the world is in dire need, God sends an avatar, a divine incarnation. 
whenever the world is in dire need. Again and again, those divine incarnations come. My dear friends, Paramahansa Yogananda is our Krishna. Paramahansa Yogananda is our avatar of yoga for the coming world civilization. He was only one individual, as we've seen, lonely, insecure, on very unfamiliar territory when he arrived here 100 years ago. But because of that divine connection that he had inside, that inseverable source of support, of strength, of victory, he was able to become a bridge maker of historic proportions showing the rest of us how to build that bridge, how to build that connection that binds us in the way, as he said, that true religion binds us to the eternal shelter. And in so doing, to build a bridge, a bridge of harmony, respect, mutual cooperation, service, and love that links and unites our entire human family. You know, I, I had mentioned earlier about this chant that expressed the spirit that our master used from those early days in Boston to launch himself in a victorious way into the, uh, the great and historic mission that he was asked to undertake. It took a lot of courage. It took that conquering spirit that we mentioned earlier. Remember when just to visualize him chanting in a way that poor Mrs. Lewis had to close all the windows. Beware, O ye mountains, stand not in my way. Your ribs will be shattered and tattered today. The world turns aside to make room for me. I come, O blazing light, the shadows must flee. That's the spirit that he wants to instill in each one of us. And for more than 30 years, he worked tirelessly to bring to all of us to the whole world, that science of religion, the science of God-realization and liberation, that science of total and complete victory and freedom in life. But, and this is so sweet, when he completed that mission, by the end of his life, a very different spirit emanated from him, a different consciousness from that conquering spirit that we were talking about. Listen to what our revered Sri Dayamataji said about Guruji, about what he was like on the very last day that he left of his life, the day he left his physical body. Dayama has written, throughout the long day of March 7th, 1952, Master was very quiet, asking that no one speak in his presence. Often that day the disciples saw his eyes turn upward to the spiritual eye center in the forehead. When he spoke at all, it was in terms of great affection, great appreciation and kindness. But most noticeable of all was the influence felt by everyone who entered his sitting room of the vibrations of intense divine love that emanated from him. She said the disciples felt as though they were standing in the presence of the great Divine Mother herself. She had taken complete possession of him, it seemed, and was using him as a perfect channel to send out waves of love to all creation. In closing, let me just say one thing. When, we, when you understand, when we understand who Paramahansa, Yoga, who Paramahansa Yogananda was and is, and when we understand what he brought to us, and when we make those teachings our daily practice, our way of life, you know what happens? 
you wake up each morning with enthusiasm. You feel as a visceral motivation the joy and privilege of using God's energy, God's intelligence, and God's unconditional love to make the world a better place. So let's take this to opportunity to renew that enthusiasm. That's the feeling of God within us. It comes through meditation. It comes through aligning our lives with that indwelling spirit, the soul, the self. That is the greatest way that we can celebrate this 100th anniversary of the day he began his liberating mission. Jai Guru. Shri Shri Paramahansa Yogananda Ki Jai. Shri Shri Paramahansa Yogananda Ki Jai.